rest of our guests to arrive and then we will get started momentarily. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few guests here online already, so in essence of time, I'm going to get started. I want to welcome each and every one of you to this engaging webinar on powerful communications, the cornerstone for gaining commitment to change. As I said before, my name is Siobhan Brown, and I am your learning and development professional for today who will be delivering this webinar. My background is that I have about 18 years of experience delivering and designing training programs. My background specifically is in change management and learning and development as well as leadership development. I actually have my CMP in change management as well as my PMP and my CTDP and I'm doing my masters right now in leadership. So I'm here to assist you in helping you to come up with some really powerful communications as it relates to change and I will have the session opened at the end for any questions. Throughout today's session, we will have Lauren Connor, who is also on the call with myself, and she will be your moderator. If you have any questions or feedback, I will ask that you please put your comments in the bottom right-hand corner where it says in the chat. You can leave any comments or questions in there, and Lauren will respond to those and let me know to sort of stop anywhere throughout the session, and I will make sure that I answer those questions for you. Throughout the session, there will be some polling questions, which I'm going to encourage your participation. So we will pause and allow you a moment to answer the questions, and then we'll tally up all of your feedback and present it back so you can see where we're, we're at in terms of the polls. There will also be a couple other opportunities for you to have open answers, in which case, again, please respond by putting your answers in the chat boxes, and Lauren will be moderating those. There's a question box there, too, specifically if you have any questions to, to ask there, and Lauren will be also moderating that. So with that, we will get started. Before we actually launch in, I am going to now turn off the video. So sorry, folks, we're going to go. And the reason being is just to ensure that we save some bandwidth on this. So let's get started with our session today on powerful communications, the cornerstone for commitment to change. So we're going to just jump into this right away with our first opening poll question. As most of you have already thought about seen change initiatives occur in your organizations and in other organizations, what you may notice is that not all of these change initiatives are successful. And there's multitudes of reasons why. But we're going to first take a look at how many change initiatives in your organizations and in businesses, maybe not necessarily in your organizations, because we know your projects are usually quite successful, right? But maybe in other organizations, how many of them do you think actually fail? So we've got four options here. There's a, 30%, B, 55%, C, 70%, and D, 90%. So we're going to open up the poll questions now, and I would like for you to respond with one of those four answers, please. So we're going to give you uh, about 30 seconds to a minute for you to respond with that. So which of those four percentages do you think best represents the amount of of change initiatives in your organization or other organizations and businesses that you think fail. All right, I can sort of see where most of us are starting to lie. Okay, so we're going to give you like five more seconds and the poll is going to close. Five, four, three, Two, one. All right. Polls are now closed. So it looks like the majority of you felt that 70% was the percentage of change initiatives that actually failed, and you would be correct. So according to John Cotter, who is a renowned change management guru, he wrote in his book, Leading Change, that approximately 70% of change initiatives in organizations and businesses fail. So he did a survey in the last decade, which was actually conducted by the McKinsey and Company of Business Executives. They indicated that the percentage of programs that are a success today is still at that 30% range. So really not much has changed in the past you know, eight, 15 years or so. 
So one of the major obstacles that hinder the overall success of change management programs is ineffective communications. And this is partially due to lack of communication. So if we think about the lack of communication, the reality is, you know, when we're working on our projects, we are so engrossed in them that we oftentimes don't feel that it's necessary to keep repeating it over and over and over again. But the reality is you can't really over communicate change. When individuals don't know what's happening, they don't know what's expected, or even why the change is occurring in the first place, they'll likely make up the reasons. And the sad reality is that their stories are usually far worse than the truth. So lack of communication tends to lead to greater resistance and further obstacles that need to be overcome. And in addition to handling the resistance, this webinar is going to be able to cover how to create a sense of urgency for the change, how to address individual concerns, and what do people actually need to have communicated to them in order to gain their commitment to the change. So specifically, this webinar, you're going to be able to learn and determine the frequency and the appropriate mediums to communicate change. We're going to be looking at how can we establish who really is the best person to communicate the change within your organization. You're also going to be able to identify who needs to be informed about the change and what is it specifically that they actually want to know that is going to get them to commit to that change. And then lastly, I'm going to show you four steps in how to create a powerful change communication script so that you can use that in your own organizations to get people to want to commit to the change. But before I move into all of this, what I would like for you to do now is just take a brief second and jot down what's one thing that you want to be able to walk away from this session. So we're going to be here till you know, between 1245 and 1 o'clock. If you can just let me know what's one thing that you want to be able to get out of today's session and that way I can tailor your responses to, to meet your needs. So go to the chat box and just jot in a couple sorry, in the question box, I'm sorry, as advice, in the question box to please write down what is one thing that you want to be able to walk away with at the end of the session to make it totally worthwhile. So I see someone here says they want trends for communications. Tips on how to get the buy-in or convince people. And then the communication script sounds natural when and not written formally. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate that one because you don't want to make it sound like you just attended a webinar on how to write the script and then when you say it back it actually sounds scripted. How to position change as something that's positive rather than negative and get the buy-in that you need from the staff. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to take those top four and we'll work with that and weave them throughout the session. I do see that there's a couple of others that are very similar to that. Unfortunately, we can't get to every single one of them. A lot of them are around best practices. I see here too, being able to communicate what the leaders really need for the change. And we're going to cover most of this, so not to worry. The main fact is that most of you want to know about how to get the buy-in, which is why you're taking this session today. So we're going to definitely address that and how to make your communications very compelling. And for those of you that I didn't get to read out what it is that you want for today's session, the mere fact that you've jotted down means that your brain is automatically going to be focused to get the response that you're looking for. And if I don't cover your question right now, when we open it up for question and answers at the very end, and that's when I'll put back on the video, you're more than happy to ask me that and I will make sure that I get those responses to you. Okay? Fair enough. So with that, we'll go continue on. So. What does change leadership actually involve? So we've got to start off right from the get-go so that we get the context for this. So change leadership in its simplest form is really a process of leading individuals through change as seamlessly as possible. So what that involves is a dynamic process which leverages strategic two-way communication. And so that when it says two-way, it's not you just telling people what to do. It's really a dialogue that you're having here. It also encourages engagement activities so that it helps to create an awareness of what the change really is about. And that's done through information sharing, com releasing compelling full facts, and then inspiring people's interests and quelling their concerns that they have with regards to the change. C talks about ensuring change readiness, and sometimes to do that you need to provide people with the necessary tools, but you also need to start talking about what the change looks like well in advance of the change, especially when the change is going to be something that's transformational. You might want to even start the communications 
good 18 months before the change is even rolling out, just to get people ready to accept the change. And then lastly, you want to be able to instill confidence through empowerment and participation. And that way you can achieve that desired future end state. So you can see by this definition, the role of the change leader is really to communicate the change in a compelling way in order to get people to take action and provide them with the tools that they need that are necessary for them to make that happen. So I have another polling question for you because this one typically comes up for most people. Is how frequently do I need to communicate my change initiative? So I would like for you to respond where you think is enough. Just once is sufficient, three to five times, five to seven times, or seven to 15 times. So the polls are open now and I want you to encourage you please to answer the question. So you've got four responses and see where, how frequently do you need to communicate your change initiative? Okay, so I can see there's like two front runners that we've got. Give you another five more seconds. All right, so we're gonna close the poll. So it looks like the majority of you, 63% of you have confirmed the answer is D, seven to 15 times, and that would be correct. And for those of you who didn't guess that, it may seem like a lot, you know, seven to 15 times. My goodness, that seems like a lot of times I'm communicating this change. But the reality is you do need to create, communicate the change very frequently and you have to do this as often as you possibly can. Reason being is that people take mini vacations. They're not always paying attention to what you're telling them. They'll take mini vacations literally and figuratively speaking. So if they're off on vacation and you communicate it once, they didn't get that message. And even if they are here, mini vacations, meaning they're off in their own little world, and they're not concerned with all the details of the project that you feel is most important to you, they might not be paying attention to that critical information. And that's why it's really important for you to repeat it over and over again. A good seven to 15 times is really where you should be aiming to be your optimal amount of communication. If you look at different ads within the media, so let's say for instance KFC, before they were known as Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Kentucky Fried Chicken didn't have necessarily the best ter terminology in terms of the word fry because now we're more health conscious, so they changed it to KFC, but it took a while. But now people just know them as that cerebrand, and they said it enough times with TV ads, radio ads, commercials, billboards, whatnot, so that you get it, and now you know that this is the change that's happened. So the same way when you're in your organization, even though you might think it's something that's very simplistic and it's very easy for people to understand and should grasp, they do need to have it communicated a good 7, 15 times for them to actually remember that. So in addition to this, you also need to use multiple mediums to communicate the change. Uh, we encourage you to use at least seven different mediums. And that reason being too is because you need to increase the likelihood that somebody will actually receive that communication. If you only use emails, for instance, you may be missing out on a whole group of people that don't access their emails on a regular basis. And I know most of you are thinking, well, you know, this time and age, most people do access their emails. While that may be true, they're bombarded with tons of emails, so they don't read all of them necessarily as thoroughly as you would like them to. So the result of that is that they turn around and they kind of put it into the trash. So what you might want to do is encourage other forms of communication, such as reports, maybe tweets, one-on-one -on -one meetings, things like town halls, or even multi-stakeholder events are all ways to engage people. If we look at the 10 levels of intimacy in today's communication, you'll notice that number one, most people gravitate to wanting to use social media, such as Twitter and Facebook, and sending those messages and even email. And those are more one-way type of communication. And as we start moving away from that towards text messaging, instant messaging, and we move to like letters and letters, this is where we start getting a little bit more into two-way type of communication. But the real rich communication comes from talking to somebody, so whether that be on the phone or video chat or face-to-face -face dialogue. And that way you can see their full expressions. Are they actually engaged in the change? Do they want to hear? Do they have a perplexed look on their face? Are they saying, yeah, I'm good? but really their arms are crossed and their body language is telling you that they're passively resisting. You're not going to get that information by sending out a tweet. Or while you might get a few people to respond back, you're not really going to know what they're thinking and feeling unless you're speaking to them, that face-to-face -face type of dialogue. 
So in addition to understanding the communication devices, you need to understand the communication spectrum. So in this slide, what you're seeing here is multiple methods of communicating with stakeholders, especially during times of change. So it's based on having lean to rich communication depth, as well as looking at a monologic to dialogic communication direction. So if you're moving from this, like, simple SMS or email, that's going to be very lean and it's also a one-way type of communication versus way over on the other spectrum where you're looking at open space technology or world cafes, that's allowing for people to have multiple dialogues back and forth, engaging with each other, and you're really involving a very rich type of communication. So I encourage you to really match the communication method to the type of engagement that you want. And then you got to take a look at what's the sequence in which you want this to occur. So maybe you might want to start off with a simple email to let people know, heads up, this is what's coming. Then you may have a one-on-one -on -one type meeting. Then you may have uh, other focus groups where people are being involved, a town hall, then maybe a world cafe. It really depends, again, on how you want to increase that engagement over a period of time. So this will be part of your overall communication strategy. So you want to utilize as many methods of communications as you possibly can so that you can build that momentum for change while at the same time you're increasing that sense of urgency that the change is coming and that people need to take this change. So the next thing that you're probably after figuring out, you know, what type of communication should you use and what is and how to establish that sense of urgency, you also have to determine who's really the best person to announce this change. Well, I would suggest that you pick someone who's a very well-respected and influential business leader within the organization to announce the change. They need to prepare key messages that define the change as clearly as possible and link it to the organization's mission, values, and strategic objectives. By doing so, leaders are going to be able to reinforce that behavior and performance expectations. Now, while senior leadership support is imperative to the success of the change project, Frontline staff also need to hear the change from their direct leader because their direct leader actually has the greatest influence over the employee's adoption to the change. So if that front leader isn't on board with the change, it's going to be very apparent. And their, their direct staff is not going to be on board with that change if they feel that their leader is not on board of the change. The reality is, according to the Corporate Leadership Council, your frontline leaders can actually impact and influence the behavior of their direct reports by up to 26%. Now, that's a huge amount that they can actually influence their team members. So it's really, really important that you engage those frontline leaders with the change and then have them, in addition to the senior leaders, announce the change to their teams because their staff are going to be looking to them for that support. So I got another polling question for you. Yes, I'm going to constantly keep you engaged and make sure that you're not flipping from screens back to forth. So what do you think is actually more important when you announce the change? That A, you need to know all there is to know about the change before you communicate it. B, to be passionate about the change that you're communicating. Or C, eh, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so I'm just going to let you sort of think about that. And the reality is, because this comes up, because a lot of people, they always want to know, you know, do I need to know all about the change before I report or communicate it and tell everybody? And the reality is, you don't. Effective communication is only 20% of what you know and 80% of how you feel what you know. And that's from Jim Ronan. So what is really important here is just to be pa passionate and authentic to increase the overall trust that they have in you as a leader. So when people have trust in you as a leader or change agent, as that may be, they're more inclined to want to follow you through the change. And while it's important for you as a leader to know the details of the change, so I'm not downplaying that, sometimes you don't know all what's going to happen and how it's going to unfold, yet you want the people on your team within your organization to follow you. So in this case, it's far better to just demonstrate your enthusiasm for the change while at the same time being honest and transparent that you're embarking on this journey together and while you're unsure of how it's all going to come together, that you're asking them to trust you and to trust the process. So when people respect you as a leader, they're going to follow you no matter what. But if they feel that you're not being completely open, honest, or transparent, then that's where you get a lot of skepticism and a lot of resistance starts to unfold. 
So now we want to think about, okay, well, how am I going to communicate this in a way that's going to be compelling and it's going to be engaging? So I've got three tips for you. We want to make sure to have very effective communications that it's one, clear, two, consistent, and three, compelling. So how are we going to make this happen? We're going to go through each of these three details. Now, the first characteristic of clear, you need to make sure that we're always answering that question for people, which is the why. Why is this change happening? And then the next one is how is it going to impact them? Just simply stating what the change is going to be is not sufficient enough for people to engage in the change because they need to understand why are we doing this. Have you ever been part of a change before where at part way through, you know, you're still confused as to why this has happened or even the change has been completely implemented and you sort of trusted the leader but then part way through after it's done you're thinking, well, why did we do this in the first place? And that, unfortunately, is because that wasn't communicated to you very clearly. And, it's, and in this day and age, especially when you're dealing with a lot of millennial generation within the organization, they're not simply going to accept that we are changing because and leave it at that and you need to fall in line. They need to understand why is it that we are changing, what is the, the, the rationale behind this, how is this linked to the organizational values, and more importantly, how is this going to impact me? Because at the end of the day, people care about what is going to happen to them. So they're going to be asking a whole bunch of other questions. And if you look at even in terms of people's personality styles, some people need to know more information than others. So you have a couple of personality styles that are perfectly okay if you just explain to them on a very high level why the change is happening and give them a, a very big vision. While others need to know what is the change all about? How are we going to get there? What's the process that's involved? What's expected of me? And without being very clear in terms of what these things are, it oftentimes results in confusion, additional resistance, and then inaction. And that's really not what we want. So we've got to make sure that the, the communication is very clear and very concise in terms of what the, the overall vision and the desired future end state is going to look like and then how are we going to get there. So that's the process and if you're unsure in terms of what the process is going to be as a leader then be honest about that too and then give constant communication which is leads me to the next point, the consistent communication. It needs to be frequent and you also need to make sure that you're using metaphors when you're describing the change that are consistent with what the change actually is. So leaders need to accurately describe the type of change that they're seeking, but they need to make sure that's in a way that people can actually understand. So I'm going to talk about that in a second first. But the first point I want to make sure that we cover is the frequent communication. So remember at the beginning when I told you how often do we need to communicate? Pausing here for a second, how often is that? 7 to 15 times. I think I've said it about five times now if we're keeping track. So I've got to say that two more times. Seven to 15 times is how often we have to communicate. Seven different ways. And so you can see on the slide here, it's very busy with a whole bunch of people being communicated in multiple different ways. But the reality is we have to be very frequent with the communications. Just once at the beginning and then once the day before that it's being launched, FYI, you need to take some training, is not sufficient to make sure that people are in the loop. So again, seven to 15 times using seven seven different methods. The next point is around the metaphors of change. So when you use a metaphor, a metaphor is defined according to Webster's New World Dictionary as a figure of speech containing an implied comparison in which a word, phrase, is ordinarily and primarily used for one thing and it's applied to another. So for instance, like the elephant in the room. That doesn't necessarily mean there's a physical element in the room, but it just means that there's a major, a really big thing that people aren't talking about that's in the room. So when we look at using metaphors to describe the change, we ought to use a metaphor that one, people can understand, and two, is an accurate description of what the change actually is. So if we use something like a, a fix and maintain, say that our, the change that we're encountering is something that we want people to fix, they'll get the images in their head as a provider or a repair person or a mechanic or a doctor. So if you want to use those terminologies, it's usually around something that changes just the type of a change. So we're looking at building and developing. 
if we look at it from a terms of we want to plan or guide people using a transitional type of change, we might use terms that are related to moving and relocating. And then the last one for would be around a transformational type change. So this is where you might use words like a liberator or visionary or creator, or catalysts. This is where we're looking at liberating and recreating, a much bigger type of change. But when you use words that are interchangeably that don't really mean the same thing, what that does is it conjures a vision in people's minds and it's extremely confusing. So as a leader, you've got to be very, very careful when you're making these metaphors that they are aligned to the actual change. So if you tell somebody, you know, for instance, hey, you know, it, what we need to do is we just need to fix our processes and make them better. In their mind, they're thinking, oh, okay, it's not a big deal. All we need to do is just, you know, make some minor tweaks to the process steps and we're good to go. When actually what you want is a whole new transformational change to, to completely scrap the old way and look at an entirely new way of doing it, using the word fix is going to have people think that it's something that's very small versus what is in your mind is transformational. So you got to be very careful with the images that you're conjuring in people's mind so you don't send them down the wrong rabbit hole. When you're designing a metaphor too, there's a couple of steps that you might want to use. So you can write down what the current change is that you're going through or sort of think about it. And then what metaphor would you use to describe this change in your organization? You could use something like a sports team or a performing arts group or another organization or business that you understand fairly well. And I have to stre stress that you understand fairly well and that others can understand fairly well. So if you use a sports analogy, but people in the organization have no idea what that sport is, using that over and over again is very confusing. So you want to be able to use something that people are familiar with, that they understand, so that they can make that connection or link to the metaphor. You can create a small drawing of what the change is and then make some linkages to the different elements of the metaphor and then map it out by linking those elements to your project. And pay particular attention to whatever ideas come across your mind. You can do this exercise actually with a group of people like your other change agents or your change team. Just ask them, you know what, just draw out what you think the change would look like and what metaphor would you use. And then take a look at what the different ideas come out. And that's also going to give you a clue if people are on the same wavelength as to what they believe the change overall is supposed to be. They think it's going to be something like a fix and build or a uh, move and relocate, liberating or building and develop. So knowing this, which metaphor would you use to describe the change in your organization? So think about a change that you're currently encountering, which metaphor would you use? So I just want you to just take a moment and sort of think about that. And just out of curiosity, I'd like to see what kind of changes that you're currently going through right now. So are we going through lots of transitional changes? Are we going through some minor developmental type changes? Or are we going through something that's major, a transformational change? I'm very curious to see where we're at right now because that's going to sort of help us relate when we're, we're moving into the com creating the compelling communications. Okay, so I see a few that have the fix and maintain. And there's some of you that are looking at the move and re relocate, but there's a, a huge portion of you that are looking at building and developing some of your leaders there. And then also transformational type changes. That's amazing. Awesome. So we're going to close that poll so that we just have a, a good idea as to sort of where you're landing with that. And now we're going to start moving into those compelling communications. So how do we put together the formula to make this happen? So first we've got to come up with what are the components of the formula. Now according to Beckard and Harris, they have a change formula that they use in order to engage people. So they have C equals A times B times D and must be greater than X. So that just almost sounds like we're back in school again. So let's break this down. C is the change that you want to see happening. A would be your level of dissatisfaction with the current status quo. B is your desirability for that desired future end state. And D is the practicality of the change actually being able to happen. So we're looking at very low risk, very low dis disruption. So A times B times B. A times B times D, so your level of dissatisfaction, your desirability for the change to happen, and the practicality that you believe the change can actually happen, must be greater than the cost of changing, so your discomfort or the, your perceived difficulty or risk of the change. And if any of those factors has a factor of zero, then it's 
all zero. So while they might desire the future and say, say yeah, this is really great, and I think we could possibly do it, but eh, I'm pretty good where we are right now. I'm really not dissatisfied. Then you get a zero for that, which means the change isn't going to happen because it's zero. So you have to make sure that each of those components have a factor that's greater than zero for it to, to actually occur. And their perception of where they're currently at, the desired end state as well as the practicality of the change has to be greater than what they believe the costs of changing would be. Otherwise, they're still not going to change. And you need to know and understand this formula very well and before you can actually move into creating the change communications. So similarly to when you watch those infomercials at home, when you're watching the show, you know, most of you have probably seen it with the vacuum cleaner where they're telling you, you know, have you ever used a vacuum cleaner and it's your, your vacuum cleaner is all heavy and it's bulky and the cord's getting all tangled up when you go up and down the stairs and you see the person with their hand behind their back like it's all in pain because they were lifting up this vacuum cleaner. What they're doing while you're watching this is they're trying to create a level of dissatisfaction with your current product that didn't pro exist previously until this moment that you've watched this. Then they introduce the new vacuum cleaner that is cordless that the head swivels and it can get into all the corners of your your area. And so that's increasing your desirability of the actual future end state where you can clean your house in a very short period of time and you're not going to hurt your back and you don't get tangled up in the cords. And then they show you how practically this change is going to, is, is so easy for you. And then they also introduce the low, low cost of three easy payments of, you know, $29.95. So the way that the marketing department has used this communication is so clever that it gets you to want to spend to buy something that you necessarily didn't even think you needed to do. So similarly, when you're looking at change in your organization, while some people think everything is fine, what you're doing is you have to introduce to them a level of dissatisfaction with the current state before they're even going to start looking at what the end state could possibly look like for them. So I want you to memorize this formula, the C equals A times B times D must be greater than X. So for the change to happen, they have to be dissatisfied with where they're currently at, they have to desire that end state, and they have to also believe that it's more practical for to that change to happen than it is for the cost of the change to occur. So knowing this now, we can move to who needs to be involved in the change, because you got to know who your audience is before you can start creating change communications for them. So you have to have a very well thought out stakeholder management plan and communication strategy. So for that to happen, you got to do a really good stakeholder change analysis. So you need to create an this sort of matrix that identifies who needs to be informed about the change and what they need to know. So any individual or group that's impacted or interested in the change is considered to be a stakeholder. And it's important to establish the position and the attitudes of the stakeholders, including their power and influence and their interests or involvement in the change so that you can determine how much and what communication needs to be given to them. So those who are highly interested in the change and are also have a lot of power, you need to manage them closely. So you probably need to give them a lot of communication versus those that don't have as much power in the organization but they're also really interested in the change, you might want to keep them informed. So you're going to have probably less communication with them, but you want to make sure still that it's frequent so you can keep them engaged. For those that have very high power in the organization, but they have low interest, you're going to need to target those people very differently. You have to ask them questions and you have to figure out why are they not completely engaged. Because maybe they have some very good reasons that you can use that will help to turn over the rest of the organization that's not on board. So those high influencers, but they're very low, elite, low engagement levels with the change, you want to make sure that you're asking them questions and involving them as part of the process as best that you can. And anything that they say, you need to listen to those. What are those their concerns? What might be some obstacles that they've identified that the change isn't going to happen. You need to listen to those things and then come up with a plan with the rest of your change team in order to make that happen and then communicate what you've done so that people can see that there's a transparent loop and that they are also involved in the change and that they're part of creating that shared overall vision of what it's supposed the end state is supposed to look like. So involving them in the change could look like something like this. 
Say, for instance, you have an employee who's very well respected in the organization. However, they are not engaged in the change. As a matter of fact, they think the change sucks, and they tell you that outright at a team meeting. So what you have to do is you, you'll, have, you'll take them out. When I say take them out, I don't mean take them out. You're going to take them for coffee or tea or something like that. And you ask them, say, hey, John, you know, you made some comments at the last meeting that you were not in alignment with the change. So I was just curious to find out, you know, what your thoughts were and um, why you felt that way. So John shares with you and says, you know what, I personally think that this was very ill thought of. You don't, we don't have enough resources within the organization to make this happen. The security is an issue and you really haven't involved all the key stakeholders. As a matter of fact, HR wasn't even pulled to the table, so I don't even know how you guys were planning on doing the training. So you see, you know what, John, those are some really great points. Thank you so much for sharing, and I'll take that back to the change team. So you have a meeting with the change team, and you describe what John's concerns were, and then you pull it to get everyone together at a town hall meeting, and you tell them something like, hey, you know what, at the last meeting that we talked to, we discussed what the change was going to look like, and we invited for the rest of you to share your thoughts and feelings. And what some of you were very open about how you felt about the, the change initiative that's being introduced, and you've provided with us some great insights in terms of your concerns and things that we need to do better. As a matter of fact, I'd really like to thank John for bringing to our attention that you know we had some deficiencies in a couple areas in terms of lack of resources, security and um, not involving all the key stakeholders. So what we've done is we've put together a plan that we are going to be inviting or we're going to be hiring a couple of consultants to come in to help us with the resourcing issue because we really don't want to overload any of you with a, a whole bunch of additional work to make sure that this change happens. So we're going to have some additional resources to help us. We're also going to be speaking and engaging IT to help us with the security measures and to make sure that our platform has the proper firewalls in place so that it's that we are securing our data. And then lastly, we have made sure that HR is involved because we recognize that they too are a very important partner and we want their say at the table. So we've invited them to share their thoughts and their concerns to make sure that this change project goes out with goes on without a hitch and that everybody's involved. So what do you think is going to happen to John at this point? Do you think he is satisfied that his needs have been met and his voice has been heard? Of course. And for those who are also in the rest of the organization who may have low power and low interest, their interest now starts to get peaked a little bit because they can see that those high influencers, their concerns have been addressed and now they're moving towards making it happen. So by having that communication outright in front of everybody, you're also starting to build momentum and you're also quelling those concerns and those obstacles. So now that we know the interest and the power, we're going to be dealing with resistance because we know that resistance is high and no matter what change that we decide to should we decide to implement there's going to be some form of resistance so I'd like to throw this question out to a few of you why do you find that people resist so think back to changes within your organization and changes that you have actually occurred why do you think that people resist change so I'm just going to take the first couple of responses that come out so if you can put those into the question box, so just put your responses. Why do people resist change? So you've got people who they, they're saying here that you, they don't have the time to communicate the change and they don't have the time to actually do the change. Um, fear, fear of the unknown. They, they change because they have to change, not because they want to actually change. Legacy systems that they have that they just can't let go of, that is so true. How many times have we known of groups that have worked on some old systems that have been around for a good 20 years and now they're being asked to change and they're trying to defend, this is, it was a good process, there's no reason for us to change. And that all comes down to the communication of the change. Because if we don't acknowledge where people were at currently and all the hard work they've done in the past, what happens is that they're not going to let go and they're going to keep stamping their feet and throwing tantrums, so to speak, because they feel that they're not being acknowledged. So there's a tip. 
always make sure that we acknowledge the past performance and let them know all the great things that they've done up to this point and all of those great things that we're going to continue to do going forward to keep them at peace. And we also want to encourage those people who were part of those legacy systems to work on the new systems of changes that we're also implementing. I see here comfort zone. Yep, people want to change because they're in their comfort zone. Um, We've got nothing being achieved in the past. That's absolutely true. So people look at past performance. People are scared. They're um, unfamiliar with what the change is going to look like. So we've got a lot of consistent answers here, not the benefits or not even be described. Bad habits are hard to die. I like that one there. Change equals fear. So we've got a lot of um, common answers there. And um, I also see there they don't know what's in it for them. That's also really key, and we're going to get to that in a bit. So when we look at the change, you know, effective leaders recognize and they understand that resistance is always going to be greater when change is unexpected or unexplained. So what they do is they take more of a proactive approach versus the reactive approach by developing strategies and compelling communications so that they can minimize those the resistance. As well, they're going to help those individuals move through what we refer to as the change curve towards commitment. So communication strategies need to be really well thought out and purposeful so that it can create that excitement to mobilize people to take action. So we're going to take a quick look at what that change curve looks like so that you can understand what people's emotions are during the change and then we'll talk about what is it that they really want to know and we can move that now into creating that script. So if we go into the transitions curve, so this would also be like the change curve, it's based off of the Kubler-Ross and it's been adapted to by Adam Hayes and Hobson. So Kubler-Ross had this change curve where she talks about at least the five different stages of grief. So a lot of the change philosophies and methodologies come off of the whole grief theory. So when people are going through grief, they usually go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then they get to acceptance. So similarly, when you are in a work environment, what happens is you'll announce the change and people go through this whole shock and disbelief, like, what? No, that's not really happening. For real? Did they really say that? I don't know. So they go through, and then some of them start feeling anxiety because they don't know what to expect. Then we go through the whole denial. No, that's not going to really happen. They said that in the past. They've always they've talked about doing these changes, and it's never happened before. So it's probably not going to happen again. They're just talking. Forget it. But once they keep hearing the communications happening over and over again, because we've been communicating it a good seven to fifteen times, you've been using a good seven different mediums. Remember? Then what happens is they start getting a little bit angry and frustrated. Some of them might even get hostile. They're like, no, I don't want to change. Everything was good. Why are we doing this? I don't understand. And they need more information. So this is where it's really important that part of the communications is around explaining the why, explaining the how, and how they can be involved. Then in the grief theory, what happens is they do this bargaining thing. So if they lost somebody, what happens is that they try to make a deal with God and ask, you know, if I'm if I do really, really well, if I behave myself, then would you please make this illness or whatever go away? What that translates like in the work environment is I'm going to use the old system to the best of my ability and I'm going to show you that we don't need to change because the old system is working perfectly fine. And if I can show you that it's working really, really fine, then we don't need to move to the new system, right? Wrong. So you, what you'll see sometimes is even a spike in productivity because people are trying to use and hold on to the old system before they move to the new system. Then once they realize that it's not going to happen, they go to what we refer to as depression. So this is where they get really sad and they vent and they complain. So at these stages, it's really important to acknowledge the losses, acknowledge where how they're feeling, empathize with them, show them that we, you know, you do understand, and that and keep reinforcing the message why we're changing, how we're going to support them, the tools that are available to help reduce some of that anxiety, show them that we're going to be providing them with training, we're providing mentoring and coaching and additional support. And by doing that, we can keep them very uh, focused on that future end state. And that, and then by encouraging them to take some risks, be creative, go ahead and, you know, take some challenges or and do some things and see what happens. That's when they start building some more momentum. And then acknowledging and recognizing them when they do a really great job helps move them through to acceptance. 
And then when we do all of this, then we can start integrating them into that whole new world state. And then they start feeling feelings of satisfaction, and the whole, then they start realizing the whole new meaning of why the change actually occurred. So by understanding this whole change curve and how people go through, you know, that sudden shock and awareness all the way through to feelings of satisfaction and integration, you can see the whole span of how people's emotions kind of rise up and down. And when you understand that span, what happens is you can tailor the communications to meet those needs. So at the end of the day, what is it that people actually really want to know? Well, they want to know the why, which is what we've already discussed. They want to know why are we changing and make sure that that's perfectly clear. And then they want to know what is it that I'm supposed to expect? What needs to continue being done the same way? What needs to stop? what's going to be improved, and what's going to be brand spanking new. If you can't answer those questions for people, they are not going to be interested in the change. So in addition to understanding why the change is happening, they need to understand what is it that they are to expect. So I'm going to repeat those things again. They need to know what's going to continue, what's going to stop, what's going to be improved upon, and what's going to be brand spanking new. And what one of your colleagues on this call has mentioned is that they also know, want to know what's in it for me. And the people are selfishly motivated. So the reality is they want to know what is the benefits of this change to them, not so much the organization or the community involved. Because when we start talking in those ways, and the reality is, you know, we do mention, um, you know, the organization in terms of what's in it for them. What do you think is happening? So when you explain the organizational and community benefits of the change strategy, and you want to make sure that it's, is it, going to be deemed a compelling communication strategy? So here's a pulling question. When you explain the organizational and community benefits of the change, do you feel that this is a compelling communication strategy? So pretty much true or false. Explaining the organizational and community, and community benefits of the change is a compelling communication strategy. So we're opening up the polls. So true or false on that. All right, I'm going to shut down the polls in the next five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so most of you have said that the answer is true. Well, it's actually false because while explaining the organizational benefits are a very good thing because people need to know, well, you know, how is it linked to the to the organization? The reality is. You're, the individuals in the organization, all they hear is blah, blah, blah. They don't care because what they want to know is how is this going to benefit me. So while it is a good communication strategy, it's not a compelling strategy. It's not compelling enough to get people to want to move into action just by saying, Saying this is what the organization is doing. It's going to help us reduce revenue and all that stuff. They don't really care. They want to know at the end of the day, how is this going to impact me? How is this going to make my life easier or is it going to make my life more difficult? How is this going to help me do what I need to do better, faster, quicker, easier? And if you can't answer those questions, that's what's compelling to them. The stuff about the organization and why it's really great is how corporate speak. It's the stuff that we have to say because they need to understand that as part of the why. But it's not compelling. So that's the point that I want to make sure that you're understanding here. So it's not that it's not a bad strategy because it is a good strategy and it is a strategy that you have to use and you have to explain why it's linked to the organizational values. But it's not necessarily deemed a compelling strategy because it's not what moves people to want to take action unless their values and attitudes are aligned with the organization's values and attitudes and they feel it's the exact same thing. If not, they don't care about all that. All they want to know is, how is this change going to impact me? What am I supposed to expect? And how is this going to make my life easier or better or make things done faster? So I just want to make sure that that's a clear thing. At the end of the day, people are selfishly motivated. So we want to make sure that we're providing them with support mechanisms to make the change easier for them. So once you've determined what the stakeholders want to know, now it's time for us to write this compelling communication so that we are able to address all of those areas that we saw in the transition curve, the different feelings that they're going to be experiencing, and the different reactions that they have with regards to change. So I'm going to present to you a four-step method in terms of announcing that change initiative. And it's pretty simple. So it's inform, educate, support, and commit. 
So step one looks at sharing that overall vision. So what is the change vision that you want people to buy into? You want to describe the factors that are leading to the change and the approach that the organization is going to take. To create that sense of urgency where we were talking about before, you have to create a dissatisfaction with where they're currently at. You need to be open, honest, and transparent about it. If you're not letting people know that where we're currently at is not working, and this is why we need to change now, then people aren't really going to be apt to making any moves. As a matter of fact, they're probably okay with being complacent with where things are at. So we really need to emphasize that this change is actually going to happen so that they know and they can get out of that denial mode. So we might start off the sentence saying something like, right now our organization is facing extinction or our organization is facing a challenge and we need to change this because we're losing revenue or we have heard from our clients that this is not what they're looking for or we've heard from clients that they would like to see an increase in terms of the communication levels that we provide to them or we have heard from clients that they're unable to access information in a timely fashion or that our forms are convoluted and that and for that reason they're not even bothering to fill it out because they can't understand how things work and in order for us to retain our customers we need to make sure that we're addressing this issue so then we need to educate people we need to build an understanding of what the change looks like by being open and transparent to help build this commitment by doing that we need to ex acknowledge the legitimacy of their anger and their frustration because people will be a little bit angry and frustrated that they have to change the way that they're doing something and then we explain the change and show how the change is going to benefit the organization and affect the team so you may say something like I understand that some of you may be feeling a bit frustrated with the current the current form right now because it's a bit difficult to fill out and uh, however in order for us to continue to maintain the levels of satisfaction that we have with our clients and to retain them we're going to need to change over our whole new system to make it more customer service friendly and easier of use in doing this we are going to ask you to join us in this as we embark on this new change and we're going to ask you to be patient throughout this process because it's going to take some time to convert from the old system to the new system and the benefit of us doing this is that we will make the process easier for you to actually fill out the forms it's we're going to provide you with scripting so that you can respond back to the customers with more ease and faster and we're also going to provide you with some training to make this happen so then we move to step three, which is around the support. Clarify that the, the personal meaning of the impact to the change. And then you might want to do this in those one-on-one -on -one sessions versus in a whole town hall or team meeting. You want to address what some of the issues and concerns are and state the confidence that you have that the changes are going to actually occur. And if you can tie the change to the benefits of the organization, even better. So you can say something like, I'm confident that this change will allow us to continue putting our customers for first if customer centricity is one of your corporate values. And I'm sure that you'll agree with me that by creating a, a support system or as a new system that's allowing our customers to input their data in a simpler way, we'll encourage them to use it, not only use it, but will also enable us to provide better customer service for them in a more timely manner. And then we move into the commitment. So be bold and ask them for their commitment. Don't just think that it's implied just because you're telling them the change is happening. So you want to provide several follow-up series and do this frequently. You also want to provide reinforcement for positive behaviors that you see people are demonstrating and provide that recognition for individuals as well as the team. So ask them straight out for their support. You can tell them that the next steps that we're going to do is we're going to be holding a town hall meeting in the next three weeks and we're going to be providing you with additional details in terms of how the training is going to roll out. I'm asking you for your support in this initiative because it's going to take us some time and we need everybody's help to make this successful. And, you, and feel free to add that, to say that you need that their help, you need their help and you need their support, because you do at the end of the day. And this is how you're going to gain their commitment by asking them. But it's really important that we always go back to the beginning. State why are we doing this to create that sense of urgency and what is going to be happening to them. So acknowledge their frustration and their anger. You know, it is going to, we're going to be up 
updating things and there's going to be a transition period and we do acknowledge that productivity will reduce. You can even answer, tell them that you know, we don't have all the answers to all the questions and you might not. In which case, you'll tell them, well, at the next meeting, we will provide you with more information on how the change is going to roll out, how this is going to impact your jobs, how this is going to impact what your, your role looks like, and for some of you, expanding the role, and for others of you, be honest with them that their roles are now going to be redesigned into something else, or if people are going to be losing their jobs too, that might be something that you might want to make sure that you talk about, at um, whether it's at this first announcement or at subsequent announcements and what you're going to do to support them. At the end of the day, it's really about just being transparent, being honest, showing enthusiasm and passion and making sure that you're gaining everybody's support by acknowledging their feelings and empathizing with them along the way. So by being very clear in terms of why we're doing this and being consistent with the 7 to 15 communications as well in seven different mediums and then making sure that you're using the right metaphors to describe what the change looks like, being compelling in your communications by using that four-step method of informing people, educating them, supporting them, and then getting them to commit, you will be able to create compelling and powerful communications to gain people's commitment to the change. And at the end of the day, when the trust is high, account, wait, sorry, when the trust account is high, communication is easy, instant, and effective, as according to Stephen Covey. So as long as you are being that effective and trustworthy leader, you will be able to gain the trust of those who will support you, and you'll be able to get them to commit to the change and follow the follow you and trust the process because they trust you as a leader. So what we're going to do is we've got about four or five minutes, and we're going to open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to answer. I'm going to turn my video back on so that you can see me. Hi everyone! So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. So if you put them in the question box. No questions? All right, I'll leave it for another minute. Ah, here we go. So it says, when you mentioned a benefit of improving customer service, how do you address such a situation when frontline employees don't buy in or want to improve service. Ooh, that's a good one. So if they don't want to buy in and they don't want to improve the customer service, you've got an even bigger problem on your hands. So let's let's start with that first. What you might want to do before you launch into full steam with the change is you're probably going to want to have to say, you know what, we want to make sure that we're involving everybody's opinions and addressing your concerns. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold a focus group. So you'll have a focus group in which you're allowing the employees to one vent because you have to allow them to vent to get over, you know, where they're previously are at before you can move them forward to get them to anywhere near that desired future end state. So what we would encourage you to do is to ask them to share with what they currently deem the customer service to look like right now. And what would they like to see it? And then how could we bridge that gap? So involving them in that dialogue is what you're actually doing is you're creating a shared vision. You're creating having them being part of what they want that future end state to look like by asking for their opinion and their involvement. Then once you have those questions answered, then you can ask them, well, what were some of the things, what would be some of the benefits of having a really good customer service look like? Ask them what some of those benefits are and then use that focus group as part of your communications that you're going to go to the rest of the team. And then when you do that, you also need to say stuff like, we, in, we we have heard from the frontline folks, from you, in terms of what your concerns are, where you currently feel that we're at, where you would like to see where we're going, and then include some of those answers in your overall communications piece. But if you're dealing with a group of individuals that don't actually want to even improve the overall service, then you have a misalignment with their values and attitudes with the organization's attitudes and values. And if there's a huge misalignment, then you have to reevaluate, are really they the right people for the job if it's completely on the opposite ends of the spectrum. But if not, chances are if they're in the customer service, there's a part of them that wants to serve others and wants to be communicative and wants to help people. In which case, we just need to start asking them those questions and making them feel as though they're involved in the process. 
So hopefully I've answered your question there. Let's see. The issue is employee engagement and resistance in change. So if you're dealing with a lot of employee engagement and resistance to the change, my first suggestion is to address it. Just tell them point blank that, you know, we've noticed that there has been some concerns with regards to the change. So let's have an open and honest conversation about it. So by engaging them and just asking them to be honest, and you too as a leader also need to be open to what they have to say. You can let them know, I don't have all the answers to all of your questions, but I want to at least hear out what you have to say. You can have them as suggestion boxes and then address it at a town hall type forum. You can have... Um, open dialogue like those lunch and learns drop in and meet and greet and talk but anywhere where they can have that face-to-face -face time with a senior leader would be ideal because that way you're demonstrating that you actually care this is why you're going out there you're passionate about the change and you want to help and support people but they're not going to see that or know that if you don't make the effort to go and talk to them their resistance levels are coming from multiple different aspects. It could be because the organization previously said they were going to change but didn't actually change. It could be because the they they personally have experienced change that didn't work well so they're bringing in that baggage. Their personality styles may be resistant because they didn't get the why. So oftentimes it's a combination of just being able to explain what some of those obstacles are, what the overall communication, what the overall change is and making sure that it's clear and it's consistent, that you're demonstrating that your empathy towards your staff and that you're listening to what they actually say. Not just hearing them and say, yeah, yeah, that's great and then never do anything about it, but you're really listening and involving them in part of the process and then using those supporters to help increase the resistance. So it's really all about talk, keep talking and keep engaging and just being open and honest and saying, I, I acknowledge that some of you are frustrated right now. How can I help? Start there, and then you'll notice that you'll start getting more responses. I think we only have time for maybe one more question because we're running short on time. We're actually even two minutes over. So we've got, um, let's see here. How early should the communication strategy be in place before the actual change starts happening? Fantastic question. So depending on how large the change is, you may want to start that communication strategy upwards of 18 months before the change is happening. If it's something like a transformational change, you're going to want to do that well in advance to start gaining, gaining that momentum and dropping the seeds. If it's a very small change, you could probably do it closer to when the change is going, is going to occur. But you still need to give time for people to adapt. So at least a good three to six months ideally before the change would be my, my recommendation. With that, I'm going to have to close off today's session, but I want to thank you all so much for your engagement and your participation. If you would like to learn more about change management and what we have to offer, please feel free to go to the Title Shift, title shift website and check us out and you can get some more information there. Lauren will also follow up with an additional email with other courses that we run with regards to change management. I hope you all have enjoyed today's session and have yourselves a wonderful day. Bye now.